So in this video, I want to show you how to um, compensate for the fact that sometimes Mac doesn't have all of the features in Excel that you find on a PC. So the one that we're talking about today is if you have um, a PC, you'll see on the data tab, you'll see that you have a forecast sheet, which will let you forecast some piece of data into the future that you would um, you know, like to predict. Unfortunately, Mac doesn't have this button. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna show you how to do this, even if you don't have this forecast sheet button. So I've copied the data into a new sheet. And the first thing that we're gonna need to do to prepare for uh, our work is we're gonna need to extend this time stamp or you know this is just a, a sequence of numbers that goes into the future so we have data for 100 days of the sale of this product we want to predict into the future so day 101 and beyond so the first thing that we're going to need to do is to extend this now just to make this somewhat easy i'm going to extend it by 25 and so i'm just going to sort of quickly uh, create a formula that's going to let me pull this down and get to right, 125 uh, predictions. So that's the first thing that we need to do to make this happen. We need to extend the time series part of what we're doing. From here, it actually gets pretty straightforward. So um, we're going to use a formula called uh, forecast.ets. And uh, what forecast.ets does for us is it's going to uh, predict a value for a future target date. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna just pick 101. Uh, and that's in, you know, in this data set, A102. Then it needs to know the values to use to make that prediction. So in this case, it's going to be all of these values here. And I'll just sort of scroll down to the end. Uh, we need to tell it uh, the timeline. So it needs to know what time values are associated with those values that we're going to use for prediction. So in this case, it's going to be T1 to 100. And then uh, finally, we want it to detect seasonality uh, just because we do. That's how our current uh, forecast sheet is set up. So there we are. Uh, that's sort of what that looks like. There's a few things we're going to need to do to make this work a little more efficiently. So we'll make the references to the cell ranges, both the values and the time stamps those are going to be absolute references because we're not going to want that framework to change. We're going to leave the target date as a relative reference so that when we pull it down, it'll automatically do what we need it to do. So that feels pretty good. So uh, we're going to just click the check mark, uh, take a look at the value that it produces. So this is the prediction. And just to, so I'm gonna sort of round this uh, just to make this a little bit easier to read. So just sort of going around that and we can go and compare that to what's actually on the prediction sheet. So if we scroll down, uh, we can see that pretty much we're in line. So 885.478, and 885.48. So that's pretty good. We can feel pretty good about that. Uh, once we have that done, we can pull down that reference all the way down and you'll see that it automatically updates uh, for each new time forecast. So if you take a look at how that's working, uh, you can see that uh, the forecast uh, is everything still locked in the right place? So we're still making predictions based on the right the right thing. 
Uh, usually at this point, I just go back and compare this value to what came before. So if we jump back to uh, sort of sheet two and we go to 125, it's 112.67 and 1125.67. Let me check that again. Yep. So we're, you know, basically step by step reproducing uh, the predictions that we made on the other sheet. The next thing that we'll need to do is we're going to need to calculate the confidence interval, right? So just to sort of back up a little bit and look at what we've done, we've calculated the actual forecast, which is a kind of point estimate of what we think uh, we should see based on the data. So that's the equivalent of this dark orange line. What we want to do now is we want to produce the 95% confidence interval or the interval estimate that's around each of those point estimates. And, you know, as you can imagine, we can do that in a pretty straightforward way with more functions. So uh, what we want to do is we want to calculate the confidence interval um, around that point estimate. So Excel gives us another uh, function that lets us do that. It's forecast ets.confint. And largely this function is going to work mostly the same. It needs to know, okay, what's my target date? It needs to know what values am I using to sort of calculate this interval estimate. And this is largely going to be the same. It needs to know what the timeline is. And again, if this looks familiar, it should. It's exactly familiar. Uh, we want to make it go to 100. And then um, it needs to know a confidence level. So this gets into a little bit of stats that we really don't cover in this class, but we want a 95% confidence interval, meaning that we can be 95% sure that our um, predicted point estimate, our point estimate is going to be within these boundaries, all right, or within this, that the real value is going to be within uh, this distance of our prediction, right? So it's sort of um, giving us a, a reasonably high quality prediction. And uh, we're going to turn on seasonality again, and that should get us through. Just to make this easier to pull down, um, I'm going to make these absolute references and make these absolute references because those shouldn't change. And then uh, when we click OK, we should get our, this is really a margin of error, right? So our 95% confidence interval will be 128 less than this and 128 more than this, right? So we're talking about units sold for a product. So the range around this point estimate is a hundred, about 128 products and change. And we can round those to whole products. Obviously we don't need uh, fractional products, but for now that's just fine. Um, now that we've laid this out in the way that we need to, we can pull down this margin of error. And now we can construct our confidence intervals with those values. So uh, this is gonna equal our point estimate minus our margin of error. And this is going to equal our point estimate plus our margin of error. And if we pull these down, we'll see that each of these sort of wraps around the predicted value for that time period by 100, in this case, 155 units sold. So, you know, just to make this sort of cleaner, 
we can uh, sort of round all these to whole numbers because it doesn't make sense for us to be talking about sales of fractional numbers. So we can just sort of pull that down. And that's a uh, pretty good. So let's compare this last row to what we have uh, calculated in uh, the forecast sheet. So 126, 970, and 1280. 1126, 971, and 1281. I'm assuming those differences are based on rounding. And they do, we round up here, we round up here, we round up here. So just rounding has made uh, that different. We could sort of take a look at it more precisely if we decided we needed to. But for now, this is pretty good. So we now we've calculated our values. We've seen that the values cohere to what's coming out of the forecast sheet. The last step is to graph it. And at this point, um, graphing it is you know pretty straightforward. If we wanted to, we could um, sort of make a fancier graph by starting these out at, you know, something like 854 so that it sort of glues in nicely. But um, I'm going to let that be a little bit, um, a little bit wonky. All we really need to do is select all of our data. And we're going to insert a, a line graph, so a 2D line graph. And when it starts, it's going to look a little bit weird because it's adding in a bunch of stuff that we actually don't want to see. So it's adding in uh, the little bit of our, con like the actual margin of error, which we don't want it to see. Like we don't care about that. So we can just sort of remove that. and it's adding in the actual time series, not recognizing that that should be in the axis. And so we can just sort of delete that. And now we've got a pretty good graph. You can see the only thing that's really missing is we don't have good labeling here, um, but we can fix that. So we can just say, you know, forecasting sales in units sold. And we can now go and just sort of do some data work to make this look just a little bit nicer. So um, we can do something like select data if we need to, uh, which we probably need to do because we're going to need to change the names of these series. So series two, we're going to give it a name. This is our um, predicted value and series four is going to be our lower bound or 95% confidence interval. And then we have an upper bound. And so when we click OK, if everything has gone well, we should now get these values being labeled and they sort of are coherent in that sense. And then at this point, we can just do things like format the data series. So, for example, it might be easier to read if this is, um, you know, sort of like that. It, we can change the colors if we think that matters. Um, we can do the same thing here just to sort of distinguish between them. And uh, there we go. Now we have our prediction and we have a reasonable 95% confidence interval around that prediction. So that gives us a nice way to think about the potential range of uh, sales of units that we could be uh, selling. So I hope that helps. Um, for those of you who do not have the forecast sheet, this is a good way for you to um, create one and um, benefit from the analysis. Have a great day.